Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Kyla McFarlane, Curator of Academic Programs Research at the Ian Potter Museum of Art at the University of Melbourne. I'm RMC for this afternoon and curator of this machine interdisciplinary online forum. This is the third in an ongoing series developed in collaboration with Dr. Danny Butt, Associate Director of Research at the Victorian College of the Arts, Faculty of Fine Art and Music in the University of Melbourne. Thank you, Danny, for your collegial and insightful collaboration. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from Wurundjeri land here in Kensington, Melbourne, and thank you all for joining us on Zoom from wherever you are. This is session one of three we're presenting across the week. Um, and if you would like more information on the following two sessions and to book, please do check the Potter website and uh, I'll drop that link into chat after the housekeeping. Today's session is co-presented with the Indigenous Data Network and the Indigenous Studies Unit in the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to thank them for their contribution today and for their support. Before I hand over to Potter Director Kelly Galatley to introduce the forum and our speakers, I'd like to note just some housekeeping information for today's session. The session's being recorded and will be available on the Potter website in the coming weeks. Live captions can be accessed through the closed captions button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, attendee chat is disabled for the session, but Q&A is definitely open and we really welcome your contribution. Your questions can be popped in the Q&A feed throughout the presentation and we'll be forwarding them to our session respondent. We hope to address some, if not all, attendee questions in the response and Q&A time at the end of the session. You can also vote on favourite questions. So if you see a question in the Q&A feed that you'd also like addressed, you can uplift it this way. Okay, so that's the housekeeping done. I'd now like to welcome to the session Kelly Galatley, Director of the Ian Potter Museum of Art. Hi, Kelly. Thank you, Carla. And hello, everyone. Um, as Carla said, I'm Kelly Galatley. I'm Director of the Potter, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the Machine Interdisciplinary Forum. As Carla noted, it's one in a series of forums we're undertaking at the Potter that proposes art making as a form of knowledge creation alongside other academic fields of inquiry and which feature a range of our academic colleagues from across the University of Melbourne. On behalf of the Ian Museum of Art and the University, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the Potter Museum is located on the University of Melbourne's Parkville campus, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I also extend that respect to any First Nations peoples joining us today, whether from within Australia or further abroad. I'm also joining you via Zoom from Wurundjeri land in Melbourne's east, close to Mullum Mullum Creek, one of the only watercourses within urban metropolitan Melbourne that's surrounded by native and regenerative, regenerative bushland for almost its entire length, and which was, of course, for tens of thousands of years, um, a place that was used sustainably as a source of food and resources and a place of culture by the Wurundjeri. Each of the Potter's forums has sought to address pressing themes of our time from interdisciplinary perspectives. Previous forums have explored themes of water and language, and now we come to machine. Today, as we experiencing, we're experiencing rapidly expanding developments in areas such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, data and algorithms are increasingly impacting our daily lives. From simulating human intelligence to collecting our personal data, the machine of the computer system engages us as individuals, communities and societies, both as creators and as consumers. Presenting a diverse program of speakers from a range of disciplines over three afternoons, machine will investigate the interface between humanity and machine across fields of research, including digital ethics, data analytics, creative writing, visual art, and mathematics. So now to session one. Today we'll hear from Darren Clinch, Levi Mackenzie Kirkbright, and James Rose from the Indigenous Data Network on the machinery of creativity, Indigenous data and computation. Darren Clinch, Batama man from Yamachi country in the Midwest of Western Australia, 
is a Senior Data Analytics Coordinator for the Indigenous Data Network. Before joining the IDN, Darren worked for the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services in a range of senior data analysis and intelligent roles, including several years as the program coordinator for the Improving, for the Improving Care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Patients Program. Darren holds multiple degrees in health and computer science. Darren's joined today by James Rose, who is the National Coordinator with the Indigenous Data Network. He's a mostly British descended seventh generation migrant Australian with ancestry including convicts, squatters and first wave 19th century invaders. James holds degrees in social science, population health and visual arts and has worked as a technical expert with remote, regional and urban Indigenous community controlled organisations for nearly 20 years. And they are both joined by Levi Mackenzie Kirkbride, who is a software engineer with the Indigenous Data Network. Like many Koori people from coastal New South Wales, Levi's ancestral First Nations are various, Yuan, Dungadi, Warami, Birupi, Gamilaro. He went to boarding school in Armidale, New South Wales on the lands of the Anawan and Gamilaro. Levi holds degrees in health and is a postgraduate student in computer science. We're also pleased and honoured to have our esteemed colleague, Professor Marcia Langton AO, as our session respondent this afternoon. Marcia is Associate Provost and Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor at the University of Melbourne and member of the Steering Committee for the Indigenous Data Network. Following Darren, James and Levi's tag team presentation, Marcia will respond and lead a Q&A with our panellists. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. And it's now my pleasure to hand over to Darren Clinch. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, as Kelly said, my name's Darren Clinch. I'm buddy my man from Western Australia in the mid part, um, if you know where Geraldton is. So I'm from Yamaji country. Um, and my talk's gonna be a little bit about GIS and data visualization, which is the kind of work that I've been doing a lot of over the last couple of years. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see my presentation. Okay, so this is um, Buddy My Country and some of you may recognise the map on the left-hand side there. Or, um, <coughs> excuse me, so that is an approximation of language areas and you can see down in the bottom corner of the northwest, the, the area labelled northwest is Buddy My Country. So this was my first introduction to geography geographic information systems. This happened in my last year of high school, which was many, many, many moons ago. And I, I actually hadn't even heard of GIS until that point. And so for two weeks, all I did was digitize aerial photographs using the kind of technology you can see on the screen here. Now, I'm not a traditionally um, a GIS person, but I've picked up a lot of skills and done a lot of training in this area. And over the nine and a half years I worked at the Department of Health and Human Services, I worked on a, a wide range of projects. And this is probably the controversially best known project that I worked on. Um, and this comes from the public report that was released earlier this year. So you might've heard of the medically supervised injecting room at the North Richmond Health Centre. And you can see on the map on the right hand side, um, I created this map with a one kilometre radius and all the blue dots inside that are locations, so latitude and longitude for call outs for Ambulance Victoria and any um, overdoses related to opioid where naloxone was administered. So that's another example of how I've used it. There's another example of GIS and uh, combining it in a data visualization tool. So this particular tool is called ClickSense um, and it's an associative data modeling um, uh, based uh, data visualization software similar to Power BI, Tableau, R and Python. So you can see what this shows is the Gippsland region or the, the, the actual eastern division of Victoria and you can see you know the eastern part of Melbourne and then through to the Gippsland region and this is an interactive software where I build all the stuff behind it. So we're getting to the stage now where a lot of there's a very blurry line between the skills you need to do need to have in order to be able to create create this kind of stuff. This is an example of a project I worked on called an Aboriginal Information System, 
Um, this is the one inside the Department of Health and Human Services. So we actually combined um, JavaScript, CSS, ClickSense, and HTML to create what you see on the screen here. And in the app itself, it's interactive. You can click on those circles, and they're like keys to a doorway that, um, that leads you into a room full of information. So, so that's um, that little bit that I wanted to show you. Now, what I'm going to show you next is an actual interactive uh, version of the software. So I, I am running off a virtual machine, so I'm taking a bit of risk that technology is not going to let me down. Um, so we'll see how this works. Okay, so this is the actual software that I use. Um, it's called ClickSense. And I've, what I've also been able to do is set up a couple of server-side extensions. So I use R and Python. So uh, earlier, um, machine learning was mentioned. So I can run forecasting uh, algorithms or I can run clustering algorithms um, or lots and lots of stuff that I can do in the background. So I build the data model in the background and then that you, what the end user gets to see is something like this. So you remember me talking about Buddy My People, which you can see if I click on that, it actually shows you exactly Buddy My Country. So this is a word cloud and you can see all the different areas. Now the map will redraw itself. So I feel like I've almost come full circle where I started off on learning GIS when I was just a teenager. Worked in the building trade for nearly 10 years. Um, and mostly all I did was stare at plans, house plans and um, real, um, new estates where houses were being built. So now I'm transferring those skills into this kind of work where I can narrate a story about data. And what I'll do is I'll just quickly show you the capability of this software. If I was interested in the area up the top, I can draw a lasso like that. Um, and then I'll, if I just say, okay, I'll select that area. And now you can see the word map has changed to reflect the language names that exist in that area. Now this comes from two different data sets. The polygons that you can see are the coloured areas. They represent national native title service locations. They're um, defined as land claim areas. So um, anybody can go and look up the NNTS. And what I've done is I've combined it with um, the Auslang data set, which comes from the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Studies. And they host that particular data set. Now, as you can see, if I point at a particular area on the map, it'll give me the coordinates, give me names. Um, and then if I point at one of the dots, it'll give me a language name. So that's an, just an approximate location of where that language was recorded um, back in history. So that gives you an idea of how I combine these things. And then just to give you a little bit of a look in the background, um, this is the actual data model. So what I do is I take data sets and I model them and join them together. So creating a bit like um, access, you know, the whole access. So you can see I've got um, linking fields between my different tables and that's what makes the, the machine run uh, or makes the visualizations work, I should say. So, um, and this is the kind of work that um, very shortly we're going to be running a national indigenous mapping workshop. Well, we aren't. Um, there's a, a mob from WA called Bunyama and we've, we've uh, recorded a keynote session for them, but I'm also uh, next year going to be one of the assistant um, trainers and teaching people how they can incorporate GIS in data visualisation because it's incredibly powerful. And then also teaching them how to um, combine things like Python algorithms and R algorithms so then you can get some really... Um, uh, complex computations done in the background, but then you can get a really smooth and interactive and engaging user experience at the front end where they don't have to see all those algorithms and stuff. But there are lots and lots of Aboriginal organisations, community organisations in Australia that is sitting on tonnes and tonnes of geocoded data. But GIS is not being um, a skill that most people think you can have as just an add-on to the rest of the skills that you've got. So I think there's been a real slow progress for people to actually add GIS to their skills capability. But as you can see from the presentation that you can see on the screen, um, it's a very, very useful uh, skill to have. And so hopefully over the, once we open up, and we're able to travel to these um, areas that we're going to be working with, our pilot sites. Um, I'll be working with Aboriginal people and saying, look, this is what you can do with the data that you have. So 
and I'll hold up there because I've gone on for too long and I'll stop screen sharing. And I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Levi. Hi, everybody. My name's Levi Mackenzie Kirkbride. Um, I'm a saltwater boy. I grew up in Sydney and down the south coast of New South Wales. Um, so for me, uh, this is home, or one of one of the few places I call home. Uh, this is Rec Bay down the south coast of Sydney. Um, it's about three, three and a half hours south of Sydney, past Wollongong. Um, but I also grew up in Sydney and around, but also I got family who ended up in, this is in Kempsey. Um, so like the Hoskins are actually from Wallaga Lake, which is Ewan. And then they migrated up to Kempsey and now some of the Hoskins are going back down South coast. So yeah, got mob from all over the place. Um, today I wanted to talk about, let me just check the chat. Make sure I'm not screwing anything up. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, designing paradigms. Um, I found it really hard to prepare for this talk because I guess I spend so much time in this headspace. But I recently, during the COVID pandemic, have had the opportunity. Um, well, I've moved in with my old brother, who's an artist, a performing artist. He's a dancer and a choreographer. And because of COVID, they've had to uh, learn how to like a lot of artists in Melbourne and across Australia are like getting these grants to try and help them like learn about digital platforms and all that sort of stuff. And so I got to see things from the other side um, of artists using the tools of engineers. Um, and so I thought I'd talk briefly about what that means and how that relates to art today. So it's my conjecture that we are living through a modern renaissance of art um, and it's because of the internet revolution. Um, so really like the modern internet started back in the 80s, 80s as a research project um, amongst universities and the military in the US. Um, and since then, we now have the internet, which connects over 4 billion people to one another. And it means that we're having more art produced today than arguably, you know, uh, in a day today, you might have as much art produced as all of Europe a couple hundred years ago in a whole year. Um, so just to sort of get the point home, uh, here's some numbers because numbers are good, right? As, as, as an engineer, I'm supposed to like numbers. Um, yeah, isn't that funny that YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, like they have bigger populations than China and India combined. Like that's pretty insane. And every single user on that platform theoretically can connect through one handshake to any other user, which means the level of density of the network is just insane. Um, but of course, numbers are boring, right? We're all artists. So... This guy has 10 million followers. I don't know who he is. It's just some guy. He has amazing art. I think what's interesting is that this is also a platform in Scram um, for Indigenous artists to start expressing themselves. So there's amazing Indigenous artists. I'll show a couple. Um, but the main point that I actually wanted to get to, which I'm just conscious of the time, so I'm going to fly through, is that here's my brother's page, Joel. Um, Here's his normal page, but his artwork that he literally submitted last night to, I believe, uh, maybe the, uh, actually I actually don't know who funded it. Um, so uh, chunky move, right. Um, he actually tried to like manipulate the platform itself so that like he's created a profile that is a piece of art. And I found that very interesting because he's actually like tried to manipulate the platform or like play with the platform itself. So each time you click on one of these, he goes into something deeper. But the real question is like, from an artist's point of view, like what the hell is going on here, right? Well, this is what's going on. This is somebody who's cloned Instagram and they've like created Instagram with the same code base as Facebook is using to actually create Instagram. Anyways, um, you can actually go and look at all of these pieces of code, which are essentially people cloning these, um, these applications, which means you can actually go in and have a look at people's 
the people who are actually making the tools of modern artists. I think that's the main point I want to get across is that like, how do I put this? Everybody's using these things and we just take it totally for granted. But at the end of the day, like people sat down and actually wrote the code for modern tools, whether it's like design tools like Sketch or whether it's YouTube and sharing platforms, people have actually made those. And a lot of their code is online and you can just go and look at it. Um, I think from an artistic point of view, this is probably the most opportune time to have been an artist. And from an indigenous point of view, this means that we can freely, like young indigenous artists can freely express sort of their cultural identity through their art in a way that's never been possible before. And some of them have tens of thousands of users. So, uh, he's better. Yep. So I don't want to take up too much time because I think that it's kind of hard to get the point across unless you actually go and look at some of the code. You don't have to understand the code, but go and look at it and understand that. So that website that I had before was github.com. You can just go and see how these people are thinking about how to design stuff. And what that means is like artists are actually thinking inside of the brains of engineers. Coding is just thinking. You just think and you write it down on a computer and then you tell the computer how to think. So all these artists who are producing these works inside of these platforms like Instagram or YouTube or whatever, they're actually doing it inside of somebody else's thoughts. And I think that's what I meant when we're saying we're designing paradigms. It's the engineers and the designers of these tech companies that are actually designing the way that art is being produced and um, distributed in our culture. So yes, it's a very strange intersection. But I'm going to conclude it there. Um, I'm going to hand over to my boss, James Rose. Um, and yes, thank you for listening. Wow, how do I um, how do I top that, Levi? Uh, <laughs> also, I don't normally get called boss, so so that's that's a nice touch as well. Um, before I start, I'd like to uh, thank the Ian Potter Museum uh, for bringing this together. I think it's um, a fantastic opportunity for the IDN to talk to um, a different audience to the ones we're used to talking to. But uh, I'd especially like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people um, and the Kulin Nations more broadly um, for allowing us to be here on their country in Naram, which is where I am um, today. Um, so as Levi um, said, and Kyla before Levi, um, I work with Darren and Levi at the IDN and with Marcia. Uh, I'm nominally a coordinator, uh, which means that I just help sort of arrange all of this incredible expertise and talent um, in a way that can be applied at a national scale, um, which is a, a pretty daunting task at times. Um, and I don't get to do a lot of the, the coding that I would really love to be um, doing, which is the kind of thing Levi was just talking about. So interestingly, um, in relation to this format, uh, my original calling, my original um, qualification was in fine arts. So I originally trained to be a painter um, and worked in community arts in South Australia um, after having grown up on the APY lands in Central Australia, but realized pretty quickly um, that there were some other interests that I had that I could deploy in ways um, that might have more um, specific impacts, you know, for the, the families and the community that I grew up in. Uh, so I went and retrained in social anthropology. And it turned out that that's what I spent most of my life doing up until uh, the point of joining the IDN. So my specific uh, expertise is in forensic social anthropology uh, in native title. And that work involves providing technical evidence to the federal court um, in support of native title claims. Now, native title is a fairly complex kind of exercise that involves proving to judges and lawyers that Indigenous people have rights in their own country, in their own lands and waters, and in the natural resources contained um, in those uh, lands and waters, within those lands and waters. And strangely, um, it's not enough for um, traditional owners themselves to be able to provide evidence to the federal court. Strangely, um, it has become common practice for the court to call on white people, such as myself. Uh, and even more strangely, it's become common practice to draw on social anthropologists. And this is really what I want to talk about, is the way that the specialised field of social anthropology has gradually been... Um, 
understood or developed um, as playing a certain role in Australian society and in British governmental and administrative culture uh, more broadly. So the reason that social anthropologists are deemed to be the most uh, relevant experts in uh, these court proceedings, in native title in particular, is that native, uh, social anthropology is understood as a translational discipline. And in order to understand how this happened, we need to go back to the 1870s when the uh, British Empire was at its peak. We had something, when I say we, um, I of course mean the empire, had something in the order of um, 50 uh, individual jurisdictions, what are today 50 countries, under their direct control. And um, in the course of administering those dominions and bringing um, the hundreds of different Indigenous communities that occupy those 50 different um, colonies under control, uh, it was decided that uh, there needed to be some way of understanding the natives, uh, not to put too fine a point on it. And so social anthropology was invented as a way of translating what were deemed to be alien ways of thinking um, and alien ways of understanding the universe um, in, in a way that could serve British interests, which was basically extractive interests. So pulling resources out of a country um, and processing them, them and channeling them back to Britain. Now, after World War II, as the British Empire began to crumble and Indigenous people began fighting back, usually through armed struggle um, against the British, social anthropologists had to reinvent themselves. And in the 60s, in Australia, uh, social anthropology as a discipline nearly fizzled out altogether. But, of course, there was a, uh, an independence push in Australia as well, um, which found its zenith in Arnhem Land in the 1960s. And suddenly anthropologists found a role for themselves again. They were called on to give expert advice um, to commissions and court-based proceedings that were trying to work out how uh, Indigenous rights in land, which were being acknowledged for the first time at law, could be understood by the court and by government. And so um, anthropology was thrown a lifeline. And what's happened since then is that uh, we've had um, refinements to heritage protection laws, uh, as well as land rights laws. And then of course, in the early 90s, we had the Native Title Act, um, which gave dozens of uh, anthropologists work. Now, Unfortunately, um, one of the consequences of being thrown this lifeline for the discipline of anthropology is that this um, uh, assertion of, uh, of anthropologists that uh, we are experts who translate uh, concepts from one culture into another uh, is still hanging around, it's still with us. And the really sad thing about this is that translation um, by definition, requires there to be a disparity between two different cultures, between the way um, uh, members of two different cultures relate to one another. Because, you know, in order for uh, a member of one culture to not understand another, there has to be something missing, you know, there has to be some, um, uh, some deficit. And usually it's a deficit on the part of the indigenous culture bearers because uh, in order for a British person, most of the time, to feel like they don't understand what's going on in Indigenous culture, um, there needs to be this idea that uh, um, there is a missing grammar, there's missing vocabulary, there are missing concepts in Indigenous culture which have to be compensated for, have to be replaced um, by more advanced and encompassing and sophisticated concepts in British culture. Um, and this is where um, the idea of creativity comes in, the theme of creativity. Because in engineering, um, the intellectual machinery of anthropology, in engineering um, the machinery of translation, uh, there is a profoundly creative um, exercise, a kind of a um, making up, if you like, a story about individual people having exclusive access to individual cultures. And this is um, really unfortunate. I mean, it's unfortunate in the first instance because it's not true. <laughs> you know, many of us, if not most of us, human beings around the world um, belong to multiple cultures, you know, uh, through our various um, lines of ancestry. 
and we move between them seamlessly in the same way that many of us speak multiple languages. So the idea that you need an anthropologist to translate a culture, you know, uh, through their specialised expert training is kind of bizarre. But, but it's also um, really sad uh, and unfortunate because it, it means that um, the anthropologists and the governmental and administrative regimes for which they work are the ones who get to decide what's missing from Indigenous cultures. They're the ones who get to decide where the deficits are. And one of the main deficits that's been asserted over the centuries uh, by anthropologists and by colonial administrations is uh, um, computational logic. You know, the sort of logic that goes into designing and deploying machinery um, for the purposes of things like um, industrial revolutions. And of course, in the developmental history of anthropology, uh, up until you know, only a couple of decades ago, Indigenous Australians were placed on this artificial hierarchy as being the furthest removed from what was and what has been deemed the apex of British culture, the Industrial Revolution. And of course, if you talk to most tech bros, they'll tell you that um, the computer revolution, the IT revolution that um, has sprung up over the last 20 years is a direct consequence of the Industrial Revolution and is therefore the exclusive domain of uh, British and Western culture, you know, give or take a few aberrations. You know, Steve Jobs was Syrian, for example. But what I really wanted to say in this lecture today is that computational logic, computational thinking is actually a global phenomenon. It's a, it's a part of every single culture because every single culture has specialised fields of knowledge and, and of uh, knowing, of experiencing the world that include astronomy, uh, that include geology, um, that include complex kinship terminologies, um, that include botanical and zoological taxonomies uh, in order to make economies work at scale, in order to manage vast dominions like the continent of Australia. And so this idea that machinery, computational logic um, and the creativity that goes with it is itself um, the exclusive domain of British culture because it is British culture that has thrown up this translational uh, field of uh, social anthropology. It's a myth, you know, it's a fantasy. And it is fundamentally um, the creative machinery of a uniquely British way of thinking, a creative machinery that positions British culture as the only rightful owner of something, which in fact is the birthright of all people, uh, which is uh, computing, data and science um, and uh, thank you for listening i really look forward to um, the discussion that uh, marcia will now be convening for us good afternoon everyone uh it's a real pleasure to join you uh at the machine event hosted by the potter museum i acknowledge the traditional owners of naram the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nations. Um, and thank you so much to Darren, Levi and James for explaining some of the work that we do in the Indigenous Data Network. I uh, am terrified of their brilliance, uh, but also delighted to be working with people like Darren, Levi and James, who think so deeply about the um, data assets of the Indigenous people of Australia. As James has pointed out at previous forums where we've presented, it's not often considered in Australian policy and legislation that Indigenous ownership of data assets is a serious and critical um, body of uh, knowledge and cultural property and intellectual property uh, that need to be taken seriously 
in the policy environment. So one of the things that we're involved in is working with the, uh, with the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation and the Coalition of Aboriginal Peak Bodies to assist them in delivering on priority four of the national partnership with Australian governments to close the gap. And our responsibility is to harness Indigenous data assets in a series of trial regions, working in collaboration with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations to establish a, uh, an Indigenous data platform and a system for local groups to um, govern, manage and use their data assets to establish their priorities for closing the gap. And of course, uh, partnerships with uh, Australian data agencies and governments, government departments that collect data uh, will be uh, involved in the project and we will be working with them to uh, link data so that local peoples, local regional, local and regional Indigenous entities that are coordinating the Close the Gap initiative across the country are able to uh, provide an evidence-based approach to closing the gap. And uh, so you can see that we're well equipped to contribute to closing the gap with uh, Darren, Levi and James contributing their awesome knowledge of data analysis, coding um, and ability to build data platforms uh, that will be the province of Indigenous Australia for the first time in Australian history. So this is a, an exciting and innovative challenge for all of us. <coughs> And as you can see, uh, our team bring together uh, not just skills in digital technology analysis uh, and data management, but also a deep social understanding and indeed an artistic understanding and cultural understandings of the best way that we can serve Indigenous communities to establish their priorities in closing the gap, but also, most importantly, to govern their data assets and to own them in an environment, in a virtual environment, where their intellectual and cultural property rights will be recognised. And so I want to comment... Uh, on what our team brings to the exercise that's been explained here today. As Levi showed you so cleverly, it's imagined that Indigenous people have no proficiency in the world of mathematics, computer logic and so on. And of course, Darren and James also commented on this. I hope in the future that we'll be able to present a seminar ourselves on Indigenous understandings of mathematics. I think slowly some people in our academy are coming to an understanding of Indigenous mathematics, particularly because of the work of Dr Chris Matthews, an Aboriginal mathematician, and some social anthropologists who've studied Aboriginal mathematics. Let me just say it out loud. Aboriginal people could always count, always had a system of mathematics. Now, in some ways, it worked differently from the one that the uh, European slash Western world has inherited from uh, particularly the Arab world um, and uh, predecessors, Phoenicians and so on. But it is indeed a logical system 
uh, and it is indeed a system of mathematics. We see ev evidence of it everywhere in the world. We as anthropologists, social anthropologists, cultural anthropologists, and uh, particularly you can see the computational logic in the way that many Aboriginal paintings are maps of landscape. And they show uh, quite a sophistication uh, in representing uh, what is apparently an abstract uh, uh, representation of uh, geometry, scale, uh, distance. Uh, but you have to have the knowledge, the cultural knowledge to read those paintings as maps and then to understand the, uh, the way in which uh, places, events, people, ideas are represented in uh, a representational form that shows uh, geometry, logic, scale, um, uh, numerical uh, concepts uh, and uh, a variety of other uh, understandings of the way that the world works uh, that are inherently scientific. So, uh, for example, um, we see in many Aboriginal paintings uh, a series of concentric circles. Sometimes there's two and sometimes there's seven. Two concentric circles usually represents a, uh, an ephemeral waterhole uh, that uh, is uh, unlikely to have uh, a water body at all times. Um, and so the two concentric circles are a uh, measurement of the probability of water being present in the water hole. However, seven concentric circles tells us that there is a very high probability of the water hole having water in it. So uh, Aboriginal symbols also represent probability. And uh, therefore, an inherently scientific um, approach to understanding environments, weather, climate, and so much more, such as human and animal behaviour, veg vegetational communities and their attributes. So with our expertise combined as it is in the Indigenous Data Network, we're able, as Darren showed so well, to map attributes of our communities based on the data available to us that includes now customary land ownership, the recognition of customary land ownership, languages, um, and therefore cultural attributes so that the data itself um, linked as it is, is able now for the first time to make sense to Indigenous people who want to analyse the world around them and develop priorities for improving their lives. So uh, I think the, that our Indigenous Data Network at the University of Melbourne brings together the kind of expertise that uh, can really change the world and change the world, especially for Indigenous people who are seeking uh, justice and equity. So I'll leave my comments there and uh, <clears throat> we're all happy to take questions. Yeah, I might jump in then, because uh, I've been reading the questions, uh, a couple directed at myself and Levi. Um, so yeah, look, creating demography data sets, which include the location of First Nation um, areas. So we know that um, uh, Melbourne is on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and others. Um, and there's been a, a bit of a, a push on social media to get people to include the um, name of the location that you're sending a letter to. So on the front of a letter, you might say, this letter is addressed to 
3,000, and underneath that it'll say Wurundjeri country, you know, land of the cool nation. It's addressed to Adelaide with the Ghana people, you know. Um, so, yeah, that, I mean, that's a great idea. There's a lot of complexity involved in that, um, particularly because of, you know, the history of um, colonial impact upon Aboriginal people and knowledge that's been lost, particularly in the areas like on the eastern states where, you know, the Aboriginal people were quite um, obviously devastated by, um, you know, the impacts of colonialism, but it also lost some of that knowledge on boundaries. So there are some complexities of identifying those boundaries. Um, so, and then there was um, also a question around the complexities on cultural protocols and also data sovereignty. So, I mean, James, James, both James and Marcia could probably speak to that one. But um, when it, if I just talk about the GIS stuff, um, there was another one where people talk about data and apps and what the role of open source software can play. So obviously I, I use R, which is open source. I also use um, Python, which is open source. Um, and I also do a lot of mapping in R using a, a, um, a software package and a package you install called Leaflet. And I can guarantee you, if you've all been on the internet and you've seen a map somewhere on the internet, it's most likely being generated creating a package called Leaflet. So there are a lot of open source um, things available, especially for Aboriginal communities who don't have lots of money, so they can't buy the really expensive products like, you know, some of the Microsoft or, you know, something like Alteryx which is very, very expensive. So, yes, we're keeping that in mind that we need to be able to go to the average community and offer them solutions that really suit their situation. Um, and then, obviously, as I said, you know, um, really taking advantage of how much open source uh, software is out there and, and coding and just the growth of code is mind-blowing. So, But I'll, I'll leave it at that. And, um, maybe James or Marcia can talk about the, the data sovereignty stuff. Uh, well, I'll flick one question to Levi, uh, and that is, uh, does cloning Instagram's code appear on Instagram or appear as an alternate format? I think uh, somebody sent us the link to GitHub. Do you want to answer that, Levi? Um, yeah, sure. Sorry, I actually didn't explain that very well. Um, essentially, uh, there's these things called Git repositories, um, Git is this system for engineers to synchronize their versions of code. Um, and github.com, G-I-T-H-U-B.com is the world's biggest platform for developers to share their code. And there's lots and lots and lots. There's, you, there's probably millions maybe there's hundreds of thousands of projects um, that you can go and look at there. And a lot of people have cloned Instagram um, and they're using technology that Facebook actually publishes um, called React, which is open source. So yeah, go and look at GitHub if you want a challenge, if you're not an engineering sort. And so uh, uh, this is how you find Instagram's code, is it Levi? Yeah, I sent the message, I sent, uh, I shared it with the um, moderators, so they might be sharing it to the participants. That's GitHub, github.com. GitHub.com. Yeah. yeah, okay, thanks for that. Yeah, Here's so another... if you type in, you can search, you can search for different things. Yeah. Here's another question for you, Levi. You mentioned social media platforms have more people than many nation states do. I was wondering what you thought about the prospects of First Peoples participation in the effective governance of these platforms, which are owned in different territories but spread across the globe. We know that the colonial nation states have been very resistant to effective participation from Indigenous communities in their operations. Are these new platforms better or worse or just different? I'm not sure what he means by new platforms. I think he might be talking about the one that we're building. Yes. I think so. <laughs> I think so. Um, yeah, so I guess there's a couple of ways to chop up that answer, the, like that question. Um, effective governance is a funny is a funny term, right? Like the way the things work is that, like as I said in the talk, it's a trivial point, but it's trivial and important. It's like people actually like sat down and coded and 
wrote millions of lines of code to build these things. Um, so the only way you can really have effective governance is if you like build it yourself, you know, um, like, what are you going to do? Like get Facebook to do what you want it to do. You're not going to do that. Like they're a corporation in America. Um, which moves me on to the second point, which is that um, these multinational corporations don't seem to really have much jurisdictional allegiance. And I think that's borne out, like that's proven by their behavior with regards to like where they keep their money and stuff across the world. So yeah, yeah. So I, I think like national affiliation is something that citizens do and corporations are not citizens. So they don't have national affiliations. Mm. Um, and lastly, if you say, are these new platforms better or worse or just different? I'm going to interpret that rather vague question as are the platforms that the IDN is building better or worse or different? I, I hope they're better. Um, my ego would like to say that they're better, <laughs> but like, that's what we'll see. So um, when I, I made this point that like computer programming is just thinking, you just put your thinking onto a computer and the skill is learning how to talk to the computers. So what I'm doing is learning how to code. And what I'm trying to do is make my computer think about data analysis in the way that community health organizations think about it. So me and James, I mean, me and Darren, when we talk, we talk about, okay, what's the correct representation from the perspective of indigenous organization, health organizations and indigenous community members? Like, how do they think about their data? And what are the stories they want to tell? And then how do we get the computers to replicate that thinking? Um, so I hope they will be different and better, but better in the context of, you know, indigenous issues. And I think importantly, it needs to be said that they'll be Indigenous owned. And importantly, we have to say that we're not building another Facebook. What we're actually building is an Indigenous <laughs> data platform for Indigenous people. So, uh, you know, you won't be invited to set up an account and send messages about what you're eating today. Uh, <laughs> rather, I think what will happen is that we'll have something that looks a bit like... Uh, um, you know, whatever platform it is that Brendan Sutton is using um, to interpret the, uh, the trends of COVID-19 in our community on which he reports every day. And so what he presents to you is data analysis uh, based on the work of, you know, hundreds of people behind the scenes um, and he, and he presents you with an interpretation that you may or may not agree with. But, you know, at a very minimum, <coughs> it is, you know, uh, numbers, charts, trends presented in pictograms. Um, and it's that kind of analysis that we are going to empower Indigenous people in our trial sites to do on the basis of the data that is most important to them in their communities. They want to interpret the trends in their communities um, in health, employment, incarceration rates, um, housing, uh, and, you know, across a range of uh, socioeconomic indicators to improve their health and social standing. So uh, this will be nothing like Facebook or Twitter. This will be... Uh, a, a, a virtual data system, much of it privately owned by the Indigenous part participating organisations and privately controlled and much of it will never be public. What the public will see is, you know, a Norman Swan type interpretation of mountains of data uh, behind the scenes um, and which has been um, given... Uh, permission to be shared by the Indigenous owners. So it's quite a complex um, legal research, um, engage, legal and research engagement with uh, about six areas in all over the next few years. But there's another question that I think we ought to answer. Um, 
Uh, James, this is for you. Uh, do you find there's enough space for realising these kinds of projects within a university context? Is the ethics and access keeping up with technology? So uh, you can uh, pick up from where I left off uh, and, and tell us what your thinking is on these matters um, to the well, extent that you want to. So this is interesting. I mean, this brings together what Levi was talking about before in terms of jurisdictional space, because a university's ethics and governance frameworks do form a kind of a jurisdictional space, which is nested inside, you know, uh, larger jurisdictional spaces. And there's a hierarchy of who gets to tell who what to do, you know, so there are parameters, there are limits on the rules and guidelines for each jurisdictional space. You know, universities nested with inside state and federal governments. And there are competing interests on the behalf of different agencies and departments that all work with different laws, different pieces of legislation. So, you know, if we think about the role that universities have played in the development of Australia's um, administration, of Australia's government, universities are really hothouses for generating the expertise that then feeds into the administration of a country in economics, in medicine, in education, in industry, and all the rest of it. And if we look at the history of um, Australia's economic development in the last 230 years um, and how, for example, um, universities rationalised or conceived of the place of Aboriginal people, Indigenous people in Australia, it was sort of nested inside this um, domain of administration of governing natives. You know, that's actually how they described it. That's how universities talked about that specialised field of knowing about other people's culture. And that's where social anthropology comes from. So the foundation chair of social anthropology is at the University of Sydney. It was created in 1923 um, and it was inhabited very briefly by um, a British South African anthropologist called Radcliffe Brown, um, who left because he was unable to actually have the influence on government that he thought was necessary. Government had a much more pernicious and small-minded um, agenda, which was to control the Aboriginal labour force in New South Wales to prevent competition with white labor in rural New South Wales. And so anthropology comes out of the, that kind of a place. That's what it was used for. So, you know, it's an open question um, for universities generally, um, but I think Melbourne University has a fairly um, clear uh, set of objectives, which is uh, evidenced by its establishment of the Indigenous Knowledge Institute this year, which is that it would like to see um, uh, indigenous expertise driving uh, the, tr the teaching um, of uh, knowledge about indigenous culture, you know, rather than British South Africans, <laughs> for example. But we'll see how we'll see how it, how it goes. You know, it's a it's a dynamic space. And could I just add to that? You know, we're all employees of the University of Melbourne and like everybody else, we're committed to the um, frameworks for the conduct of research, ethics, um, protocols for engaging with communities. Um, we're not anarchists. Uh, and the best way to achieve what we want to achieve at the moment is to work uh, at the University of Melbourne which has given us enormous support to achieve what we've achieved so far. Uh, our project is established, it's funded, it's staffed. Um, we have a, a game plan, a research plan. Um, so we're not independent agents. We are employees of the University of Melbourne. Um, but we will work in collaboration with Indigenous communities and corporations. So I'm not really sure what the point of that question was, but I just wanted uh, to give James and others the opportunity to answer it. Um, now about getting involved with the IDN, um, here's a question. Um, wonderful talks, is there a way to get involved with the IDN? Do you have advice on starting projects like these independently from the structures of universities? Oh, uh, well, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, does anyone want to have a go at it? 
Darren? Uh, yeah, look, I'll, I'll, I think that there's there's been a lot of um, organisations out there, Aboriginal organisations, and particularly um, I've seen examples of archivists who have set up um, uh, media hubs. So they've had to um, be very creative. Um, and I think that the thing that a lot of people don't understand about Aboriginal organisations, particularly community-controlled organisations and health funds, is that they've usually run on the smell of an oily rag. Um, I know that because I've worked for a couple. Um, and the, there's um, always uh, big issues that they're dealing with. And quite often, um, you know, if they're regional, remote or very remote, um, their access to technology and particularly things like internet um, in the current day um, can be quite haphazard and, and not overly reliable. So, but there are plenty of land councils and James could probably um, uh, expand on this, um, plenty of um, land councils as well who've been collecting information and data and, and archives and photographs and videos and music and all of this. And so there's, there are Aboriginal organisations right across this country who are grappling with these problems now. Some of them have come up with some very innovative um, approaches. Um, I'm sure that James could probably speak a bit more to the work that's been done in Ware, um, where they, you know, they created a cyclone-proof um, uh, container area for their archives, and then they use technology to share through a, you know, almost like a TV channel approach. Um, so then the Aboriginal people of that area could actually have direct access to their own information, their songs, their dance, their music, and all their archival footage and stuff. So there are really classic examples of where Aboriginal people are really jumping into the technology space and taking advantage of things. So I think it's, I mean, even we don't know what the full gamut of um, projects are that are out there. But in this day and age, we'd be more than happy to talk to people um, and, and run through some of those options about, you know, um, you know what software's out there that you could use, but you really need to work out what you want to achieve with it. So, um, yeah, that's probably my best answer on that. If you want to add to that, James? Uh, yeah, look, no, I mean, it's, it's well established. Um, there are land councils that have been in operation for many decades now. Um, and Marcia, you know, has uh, helped um, establish some of those land councils and has been a founding um, um, a member of a number of those land councils. And, yeah, Darren, you're, you know, you're right. There are huge repositories. I mean, treasure troves of uh, cultural heritage information held by those, um, those organisations that aren't held by anybody else, as they should rightly be. Um, but how to organise those uh, in a common way that you know, everybody can support, that when I say everybody, I mean the owners of that information who generated it, is, is a really challenging task, and that is a big part um, of what the IDN does. So we ran a national survey last year uh, funded by the Australian Research Data Commons um, as one of our inaugural projects, actually, where we interviewed a number of key land councils and native title service providers about their understanding of data sovereignty and data governance principles to find out how we might be able to join together some of the common um, threads in, in those different understandings to build a national governance framework. And ultimately that's you know, what the four of us and, and our colleagues, such as Linda Norman Parker, who, who worked um, in the What Air Community um, uh, project that you mentioned there, um, can contribute to. It looks like the Socialist Workers Alliance have joined us now. I'll put these two questions up I don't expect you to answer them, but I do think uh, a few comments uh, are needed. Uh, okay, from an anonymous attendee, I don't usually answer any correspondence <clears throat> or messages from anonymous people, but let's just pretend that this person was given a name by his or her mother. How do we use technology to uphold Indigenous perspectives and knowledge without exploiting the culture? Oh dear, we Aboriginal people are always exploiting our own culture, aren't we? Shocking. Uh, and here's one from David Roussel. His mother gave him a name. Thanks for all your th thoughtful work. Thank you, David. Thinking across the presentations here, I am struck by the, okay, here we go, guys. Logo, uh, colonial logocentrism that seems to dominate each of the conventional paradigms machineries discussed. Actually, they're not conventional. 
David, but whatever. GIS, machine learning, Instagram. Uh, I think you missed the point. Uh, the anthropological translation machine. There was one once upon a time, but it was a joke, dear. Um, and reductive scientisms. Did you know that, James? Where our work is reductive scientism. I don't think so. All, I do not believe so, and I refute that. All seem to rely on a binary dualistic logic that abstracts, extracts, extracts data as commodified value from the field of life. I'm wondering about the possibility of developing alternative ontological paradigms for coding. We didn't have any of those when we started out, did we, guys? Not. Uh, data sensing, analytics and computational thought that are built on Aboriginal logics, ethics, aesthetics, knowledges and mathematical understandings. Marcia's discussion of Aboriginal mathematics and the broader IDN project seems to gesture towards these potentials. In about five minutes, yes, that's what I did. Um, I'm interested to hear more, perhaps even in terms of speculative or visionary ideas for future work. Well, uh, we're submitting articles for publication and perhaps you'd like to, you know, follow our website um, to see how we are progressing that work. Um, I think it's very unfortunate that people immediately start out by, <clears throat> you know, engaging in the... Uh, you know, anti-neoliberal name-calling stuff uh, before they even begin to understand what we're doing. I, I would suggest that these two questions demonstrate a very poor understanding of what we're explained, we've explained about our work, and I do not believe that we have um, uh, failed to explain our work adequately. Um, so, um, James, Darren... Um, would any of you like to comment? I'm just going to share our screen, our screen for a moment. Um, this is the website of our project, the Indigenous Data Network. So you can Google it to get the rather long website address. Um, and on our steering group, you can see that we have uh, an Aboriginal dean, uh, an Aboriginal professor of epidemiology, uh, the Pro Vice-Chancellor Indigenous of our university, Sean Ewan, myself. I'm the Professor of uh, Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne and have been for 20 years. I'm also the distinguished, a distinguished Redmond Barry Professor. Craig Ritchie, CEO of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Epidemiologist, Dr. Kalinda Griffiths. Um, and quite a few others. Um, and we do indeed bring an Aboriginal logic to this entire exercise. So if you follow our website, uh, in the near future, we'll have news up about our progress. Does anyone want to uh, address these questions? I'd, I'd like to make a comment there, Marcia, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So the, the, the last bit was about, you know, different type of, approach to using technology so i've always had aboriginal like art that my relatives have done in my house and when i was a kid mum and dad would take us on long drives but they would stop at places and they weren't always recognizable they were the places that mum and dad knew that nobody else knew or non-aboriginal people didn't know so in a way they were kind of training me to lock in a story to a location now when i think about art and what you're talking about marcia how um Aboriginal people through, you know, their thinking um, can recreate landscapes in paintings without ever having been in an aeroplane. So, and, and when you explain that symbol, what I would love to be able to do is use geometry imagery and unpinned from a map and then to recreate Aboriginal art because that art is actually the way we think. And then those pieces on the map became a key because they're created electronically become a key to a, uh, to a door that gives you more information, but it's in a fourth dimensional uh, kind of way instead of going, you know, left traditional left to right presentation, which is how people work with data. But see, I'm building all the, the infrastructure to be able to do that where I have artwork and you navigate data using art, but you navigate it the way an average person thinks about it. 
And a classic example would be saying, if you ask an Aboriginal person about their family, they're not, you're not just talking about their mother and the father and brothers and sisters. You're talking about all of them. So, and, and representing that in art and using data and coding in science. So that's what we're hoping to achieve with some of the work that we're doing, which is I, don't, I haven't seen anything really that's like that yet. Um, I think in res my response to that would be to the anonymous attendee, how do we use technology to uphold Indigenous perspectives and knowledge without exploiting the culture? I'm not entirely sure that I understand the question. Um, yeah. That's right. Um, the question doesn't make yeah. any sense. We as Aboriginal people ourselves... Who are do they mean like other people Aboriginal who are cultures, not Indigenous? Yeah, we're born and raised in Aboriginal cultures. I don't think we need to uh, tolerate yeah. this kind of criticism of our standing in the Aboriginal world. Uh, yeah. We are free, like any other Aboriginal person, to interpret our cultures and to be innovative with our cultural resources in making our worlds a better place. Uh, and to David Roussel, I think, um, that's a very long comment. I'm not entirely, so I probably deviate from other pe people like a bit. And I've had this discussion with James and Darren, although not Marcy yet, <laughs> but like, I don't really understand what like, like mathematics is like just mathematics. Like, Sure, there's numerals and like there's different base systems and stuff. But at the end of the day, like we've even got an Indigenous mathematician who did his PhD at Oxford, who Marcy introduced me to recently. And he does like the maths of Indigenous kinship systems. And he's currently studying evolutionary game theory and the emergence of this thing called the grandmother effect, I think. Um, and but like at the end of the day, he's still just using maths. Like he's just like he's sitting down and he's drawing out networks and he's like applying operations over sets of elements or like, you know, he's just doing maths and he happens to be Aboriginal and he happens to be applying it to something that is a cultural phenomenon within, within his family. Um, yeah. Like computation, like computational thinking, like these, these things are like universal. Like I was even, I like have a program that I wrote a while ago. I wrote it in Python and I was trying to model the Aranda kinship system so that you could like, put in a name and then see the relationship to other people. So you could just programmatically like see the relationships. It's actually really hard to do because I'm not very good at it at like network theory, but like at the end of the day, you're just using the computers to do something else that is culturally specific. Um, yeah. So I, I think to get to the heart of what that person's saying, David Russell, the way you do those things, which is um, uh, the, computational thoughts that are built on Aboriginal logics, ethics, aesthetics, knowledges, and mathematical understandings. Like if you want to do that, you just get Aboriginal people to build stuff, which means we need to get more Aboriginal people with a strong uh, grounding in numeracy and computer skills and engineering and data. Science. Like we just, if you want those, if you want Aboriginal output, you need Aboriginal people making the technology. And it wouldn't it be nice if people regarded us as fully human? That would be nice. Anyway, I think that's all the time that we have for questions. I want to thank everybody for listening to us. Um, it's been a real privilege to join the Potter Events team um, and present to you on the Indigenous Data Network. Um, follow our website. In the near future, we'll have news up about our progress. Um, And uh, indeed, we may uh, next year be able to have uh, some online seminars to explain our work further. So thanks to the team behind the scene for enabling this. And thank you very much, Darren, Levi and James. Many thanks to the staff of the Potter Institute. I mean, sorry, Potter Museum. Um, Thanks so much, Marcia and James and Le Levi and Darren. Um, what a fantastic session. Um, thanks so much for joining us and um, thank you attendees, even though we can't see you, it's great to have you here and thank you for forwarding all your questions today.
I'm sure you'll want to join me in, in thanking our panellists remotely. <laughs> um, and we will resume tomorrow on Zoom again at 2pm and again on Thursday at 2 um, we look forward to you, to all of you joining us again. I've linked to the webinar um, for bookings in the chat uh, if you'd like information on the following sessions or would like to book into them uh, and check the Potter website for details. And just a reminder too that um, we're recording all these sessions and they will be on the Potter website in the coming weeks. Thanks, everyone.